Now we're gonna look at something called spinal muscular atrophy, all right? I must tell you that before researching it for this broadcast, it was not a disease that was on my radar, but it's out there. So what is it exactly? So uh, spinal muscular atrophy is actually the most common genetic cause of infant death. So it's not the most common genetic disease, but it's the most common infant lethal genetic well, disease. Well, I'm not a pediatrician. Yes. That probably accounts for my ignorance. Yes. Um, so pediatricians probably will run across this at some point in their career. It's, again, a neurodegenerative disorder. And here the problem is, uh, is a motor neuron issue uh, primarily. And so b because of a genetic predisposition, this disease is autosomal recessive. Okay. Um, and affected patients tend to have uh, a presentation with weakness of their limbs and also in more severe forms, their bulbar musculature and uh, respiratory function as well. Um, and uh, it's, again, after the time of diagnosis, maybe a little bit more gain, but eventually a plateau and then a relentless decline in function in, in the people affected. Uh, editorial here, this isn't little kids. Mm -hmm. This is dreadful. It well, sounds awful. Yeah, so again, it is a spectrum disorder, so it can present in infants. That's the most common group, so the um, incidence is about 60% to present with the most severe form, which presents before six months of age, what we called in the natural history type 1 SMA. Um, but there are milder forms that could present at later times of life as well. There are children who start to walk and eventually start to become weaker after they are walking. And then there's even an adult onset form, which presents after age 18 years. Um, and can mimic ALS and other neurodegenerative so disorders. If we were to give adulthood. it nomenclature, type one is infant onset, mm -hmm. type two is intermediate, as you described, mm -hmm. then there's types three and four, mm -hmm. and they even have names. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, I, I did look this up. Kugelberg, or <laughs> Kugelberg, well under disease. Yes. So Wernick Hoffman would be the most okay. uh, severe, presenting before six months of age, um, and then type two is defined by having sat but never achieving walking, um, and type three would be achieving walking and maybe losing that ability over life or perhaps retaining it, and that's Kugelberg well under disease. And then there's the uh, very rare type four adult onset form. We come back to a question. And here, because it's young children mostly, it's not the child who's gonna walk into your office and say, look at me, I've got a problem. It's parents, right? Do parents recognize this early? Do parents, do you think, come to you and say, my kid's got a rare disease, what do I do? Yes, um, I think seeing um, progression in such a young age and then start to see a decline, I think parents are usually the very first to recognize that there's a problem um, and then immediately reach out to their physician. Um, the horror of that recognition. I mean, I didn't get it till I was a parent. Now that I am, I can't even imagine what parents are going through. Do you see the parents with this? Yes, and I think one of the challenges, again, is as the pediatrician taking care of this disease, because it, again, is rare, one in 10,000 incidents approximately in the population. Um, some of the symptoms that patients start presenting with are, are relatively diffuse and more common. So the most common thing would be in an infant hypotonia and a little bit of floppiness, which can be part of normal spectrum of development in some kids. And most uh, primary specialists might think of something like maybe inst instituting some physical therapy for a couple of months and seeing whether that helps the patient. Um, but in SMA type one, that is an eternity because they're gonna get worse during that time and start to show problems with their breathing and their feeding. Um, so it's really important to recognize this disorder early on, but there's many other mimics of SMA that could present with very similar symptoms in that same age group. And again, you said this is genetic. Is there a name for this gene? Do we know where it is on the genome? Yeah, so this is a unique um, genetic situation in this disorder. So uh, the problem is with the survival motor neuron or SMN gene. Um, and there's two copies of that gene on chromosome five, SMN1 and SMN2. Um, they're quite similar to each other. They only differ in a few nucleotides. Um, but there's one critical nucleotide for function that's different between the two of them. And so people with genetic SMA most often have a deletion of that SMN1 gene, both copies. So they're missing their SMN1 gene or part of it for function on both alleles. Um, sometimes one is deleted and the other is mutated in some way to make it non-functional. Um, but um, because of that missing SMN1 gene, they're reliant on the SMN2 gene to make survival motor neuron protein or SMN protein. So in contrast to Huntington's where the problem is toxic gain of function, in SMA it's missing something that's the issue. So they're missing that SMN protein and 
because they're deficient in SMN, um, they develop these symptoms of motor neuron loss and weakness.